If you want to level up your prosthetic expertise, this video is for you. We will uncover common misunderstandings about prosthetic gait and use those to improve our knowledge on how to build better prosthetics for the major amputation levels. Here's something every prosthetist needs to understand. Losing a limb doesn't just remove tissue, it rewrites the rules of walking. Humans have a natural sweet spot for their walking speed. At around 1.2 meters per second, we burn the least amount of energy per distance on flat ground, go slower or faster, and your energy cost spikes. Now imagine losing part of your lower limb. Suddenly your body has to work harder, a lot harder to move. That sweet spot shifts and walking the same distance at the same speed takes much more effort. So does that mean the higher the amputation level, the slower the walking speed? Well, yes and no. Let's unpack why. Here is where it gets interesting. People with unilateral below knee amputations often walk the fastest of all amputee groups, even faster than partial foot amputations. Wouldn't you expect that a higher amputation level leads to a reduced walking speed? Let's break that down. Losing part of the forefoot sounds minor, but biomechanically it's huge. Why? Because the forefoot lever is critical for rolling your weight forward and keeping the knee passively locked. Without it, the body compensates, often by forcing the knee back into hyperextension to stabilize. That's why simple foot prosthetics without biomechanical benefits are sometimes not the ideal solution to restore normal walking. We need devices that rebuild the lost foot lever, like advanced AFO variations with a ventral shell and sufficient forefoot stiffness. This enables the user to shift the weight forward again, extend the knee passively and regain the physiological stability while standing or walking. Without them, even forefoot amputees can end up walking slower and are prone to compensations like a gino recovatum, a gino varum or other unwanted adaptations. But all in all you can say, the higher the amputation level, more energy is required for holding a certain walking speed. Not only the amputation level, but also the amputation cause plays a huge role. Vascular causes, for example, bring a whole set of comorbidities to the table, which are influencing the self-selected walking speed and energy requirements of the user. Now, if we zoom in on each amputation level, we'll see that every level comes with its own characteristics. And those unique characteristics affect not just how someone walks, but also the way we design prosthetic care. Understanding these differences is crucial for everybody involved. We already looked at one unique challenge of the forefoot amputation. Now let's look at transtibial amputations. Even here there are some classic differences compared to non-amputees. Slightly slower walking speed, reduced push-off, asymmetrical gait and less load on the prosthetic side. Zoom in and you'll spot some fascinating adaptations. Early in the stance phase for example, transtibial amputees bend their knees less in the stance phase flexion than non-amputees. But here's the twist. Instead of letting the knee buckle, users actively resist with stronger contractions of the knee extensors and flexors. This strategy reduces socket pressures in the distal anterior part of the socket. This clearly shows that this part of the socket is crucial for a really good transtibial prosthesis. Nonetheless, you will most likely see a reduced dense place flexion in transtibial amputees. For transfemoral amputees, the hip becomes the powerhouse of walking. But here's the problem. Some sockets restrict hip mobility. And that's a big issue. If the hip can't extend freely, the user can't generate the forward momentum they need. And there's more. Unlike transtibial amputees, many transfemoral users have little or no knee flexion during stance, unless they're using high-end knees. Why? In older designs, bending the prosthetic knee during stance used to mean one thing, falling to stay safe Users developed compensations like driving the prosthetic foot forcefully into the ground and forcing the hip into extension right at the start of the stance phase. These habits often stick even when we switch to modern knees. During the swing phase, if the prosthetic knee stays too straight, the foot can catch on the ground and creates a tripping hazard. So users adopt compensations like vaulting, hip hiking and circumduction. These moves keep them safe, but they are less efficient and burn more energy. The fix? A combination of the right prosthetic components and targeted gait training to reduce compensations. 
Now, hip disarticulations. At this point, the user has lost the ability to actively push off on the prosthetic side. During stands on the prosthetic side, they're essentially a passive passenger, relying on the prosthetic system to bring them forward. Here's something surprising. Unlike other amputation levels, hip disarticulation users spend more time standing on the prosthetic side during walking. Why? Because it takes extra time for the passive mechanics to bring the body forward. So the sound side can take over and drive the next step. Controlling the prosthesis relies heavily on the core and trunk muscles. A typical mechanic here is rotating the pelvis inward to swing the prosthetic leg forward. But wait, wouldn't that make the leg swing too far inward and cause tripping? That's why engineers angled the axis in some hip joints so the leg moves naturally forward instead. And do you remember those typical compensation movements we talked about earlier? Almost every hip disarticulation user relies on vaulting in order to get the prosthetic leg through. At this level, it's part of a typical walking strategy. And that's the real takeaway. The more deeply we understand the unique challenges of each amputation level, the better we can restore movement, confidence and quality of life.